All right, so we've been singing, right? And I love to sing. Don't y'all? You know, and VBS is coming up. Vacation Bible School is coming up. And uh, one of the songs that I remember from Vacation Bible School, and I'm sure that you remember it just as well, is Zacchaeus. Y'all know the Zacchaeus song, right? Right? Okay, well, why don't y'all sing with me, right? Huh? Yeah, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. Because I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. This morning I thought it would be appropriate, you know, since we've been talking about Vacation Bible School and all that, to talk about one of the stories that we learned as children in uh, Vacation Bible School and such. It's the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Now, for some of us, that's way back. Okay, but we can still remember the story, right? Yeah, as a child, it was always one of my favorite stories because, you know, as a kid, you're short. You're small, and you can't see around the adults, and, and you can't see what's going on. Always trying to see. Beyond that, it was a very simple story. It really is a very simple story with a happy ending. And so the story of Zacchaeus, it really resonated with me, and I'm sure it did with you as well. But what I'd like to do this morning is take another look at that story, since now I'm a little bit older than I was back then, and see what it has to say to us now. You know, even though the song we sang uh, is remarkably close to Scripture as far as it goes, it kind of leaves the story hanging. The song ends with Jesus talking to Zacchaeus, But it never tells us the result. What happened when Jesus talked to him? This morning, I want to see, want us to see what an encounter with Jesus is like. I want us to see how we can know that salvation is real because it causes a radical change in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word and Lord for simple stories like Zacchaeus, but how much they they reveal. Father, it is a blessing to have your word. It's a blessing to know what happened with Zacchaeus and to know that the same thing can happen in our lives. And Father, as we open it up this morning, Lord, I just pray that I would get out of the way and that, that, Father, your truth would come through loud and clear. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture passage this morning is Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And as we we pick up the story, as we pick up this narrative, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for the last time. It's in the final weeks of Jesus' life here on earth. And as he comes into Jericho, there's a large crowd of people that are gathering around to see him. Some had heard of him before. Others are excited because they just heard that he had healed a blind man on the way as he was coming into town. Y'all remember the blind man. You may have heard of him, you know, Bartimaeus. Needless to say, this healing caused quite a sensation. So let's see what the scripture has to say. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once. And welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He's going to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, 
Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, it would have been a pretty large crowd there along the roads uh, as Jesus came into Jericho, even if it was only the priests who had come to see him. Some historians say that half of all the priests in Israel lived in Jericho. And certainly they'd be curious. They'd want to see this Jesus that they had heard so much about. And obviously, though, it wasn't only the priests that want to see Jesus. It seemed as if the whole town had turned out to line the streets. And there's a man there in Jericho, and his name is Zacchaeus. And our text tells us a little bit about him. First of all, he was a tax collector. Tax collectors are not usually the most well-liked people, are they? Even in our times. You know, we have Teacher Appreciation Day. We have Administrative Assistant Day. We even have a Boss's Day. But I really don't remember hearing about an IRS Agent's Day. You know, back then it would have been even worse. See, the tax collectors worked for the Romans. And as far as the Jews were concerned, the Romans were an occupying army. The Romans were despised and Zacchaeus was working with them. Further, he was a chief tax collector. That means he had other tax collectors working for him. He wasn't just one of the bad guys. He was one of the head bad guys. We also see that Zacchaeus was rich. The implication here is that Zacchaeus got that way by collecting too much tax and keeping the difference. And that's not at all uncommon. And further, it alienated the tax collectors from the people. They were, after all, stealing from their countrymen to line their own pockets. So Zacchaeus was not a well-liked man. He was not the kind of guy that you would just hang out with. As the Jews would say, he was a sinner. Zacchaeus' name is also kind of interesting. You know, many times the names in the Bible have meanings in the context of the story. People gave a lot more thought to names back then than we do now. That's one reason that we see people in the Bible being given new names. You know, Abram, exalted father, became Abraham, father of many. Jacob, the heel grabber, or he deceives, became Israel. He struggles with God. Hosea, salvation, became Joshua. The Lord saves. Jesus renamed Simon to Peter, and so on. There's lots of different places where people got new names. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus means righteous one or innocent. Now, certainly Zacchaeus was not righteous. Zacchaeus was not innocent. He was a thief. And as far as his his neighbors were concerned, he was a traitor. Maybe Zacchaeus is one of those ironic names that people get, those nicknames. You know, like they call somebody tiny when he's this huge guy, right? Or curly when he's bald, you know? And you can just hear it, right? As he walks down the street, you know? Someone says, hey, righteous, how much did you take today? Hey, Righteous, who'd you rip off this time? Our text also tells us that Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. He was curious about this man. He was curious about this this prophet, this, this rabbi. He'd heard that Jesus was different. That he would talk to sinners. That he would, excuse me, be seen with sinners and would even eat with them. And so Zacchaeus, he wanted to see him. He wanted to see what this Jesus 
was all about. But Zacchaeus had two problems. He had two problems. The first problem was the crowd. There was a throng of people surrounding Jesus as he walked. And there was a crowd that was lining the street and they would not let Zacchaeus close enough to see. He couldn't see over him. I mean, he was vertically challenged, right? And there was nowhere to go for him to see around them. You know, maybe Zacchaeus, he tried to push his way through, but the crowd pushed back and they wouldn't let him see. So who was in this crowd? There were two kinds of people on one side. There were those who represent the world. As it lined the streets and blocked Zacchaeus' view, the world tried to accomplish its goal of keeping Zacchaeus from the Lord. Even today, the world tries to push back and crowd out the message of Jesus. When people are curious about the Lord, the world pushes back in so many ways. The world ridicules Christianity. The world tries to suppress the message of Christ. The world tries to substitute so many things for the one thing, the one thing that can save someone from the eternal consequences of their sin. We see it every day. You know, the thing that you really need to be satisfied is a new car. Or a better job. Or more money. If you don't like something about yourself, then have some surgery to fix it. Your problem isn't spiritual. You've just got low self-esteem. Feeling guilty about something? Don't worry, everybody does it. Conflicted? Get some counseling to resolve your inner turmoil. Maybe take up yoga or meditation. Anything but that silly Christianity. The world tries really hard to keep people from Christianity today. And the world was trying really hard to keep Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. But also in that crowd were the religious people of the day. The the priests and other religious leaders lined the streets and they prevented Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. As they gathered along the road vying for the best position, they blocked the view of everyone behind them. They wanted to show everyone how in tune they were with spiritual things. They wanted to be up front. They wanted everyone to see them. They didn't know Jesus any more than those who were of the world, but they had the religious rituals down. They knew the religion. You know, it's it's not much different today, is it? Churches are filled with people who know about Jesus, but don't really know him. They want people to see how pious they are, how devout they are. But when it comes to making a difference in the world, they're lacking. Jesus talked about those religious types when he called out the Pharisees and chastised the hypocrites. He warned the disciples not to be like them. He said they liked to be seen doing all of their good deeds. He said they wanted to be recognized and and honored. They wanted the best seats in the synagogue. and They prayed so that others can see them. They kept the religion by faithfulness, by the tithing of even the smallest things, their their dill, their herbs. But Jesus said they did not uphold justice or mercy or faithfulness. They, or should I say we, look down, (laughs) excuse me, look down on those who don't live up to our standards. By our actions and by our attitudes, we push people away from Jesus. Think it's not us? Be honest with yourself. What's your first reaction when you see a homeless person on the side of the road? 
or an obviously unwed mother in the grocery store pushing a grocery cart through, through there with three little kids in it and some teenager with tattoos and piercings walking down the street. Compare that, <clears throat> Compare that to Jesus' reaction. In Matthew, we read, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In Mark, Jesus is there and a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reaches out his hand and he touched the man. I'm willing. Be clean. What was his reaction to the Samaritan woman in John 4? Did he look down his nose at her or did he give her the gospel that leads to life? You know, it, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing when the people who should be bringing others to Jesus are actually standing in the way. Putting up barriers instead of tearing them down. When Mahatma Gandhi was one of the religious leaders, the spiritual leaders of India, he was asked by some missionaries, he, you know, what is the greatest hindrance to Christianity in India? His answer, Christians. But we'll get, we'll get back. We'll get back to those religious people in a minute. So Zacchaeus' first problem was the crowd. It was keeping him away from Jesus. His second problem was himself. Zacchaeus kept himself away. Look where he is. He's, he's up in a tree. Okay? The tree's behind the crowd. Zacchaeus was desperate to see Jesus. Running to get ahead of a crowd and climbing up a tree are not normal activities for a grown man. So we can see that he was desperate to see Jesus. But at the same time, he's trying not to be seen. Zacchaeus could have run ahead of the crowd. He could have gotten in front. But instead, he climbed a tree behind the crowd. Why would he do that? Maybe, maybe he was afraid to get too close to Jesus. Maybe he was afraid that if he got close, that Jesus would reject him. Everybody else had. Maybe he understood that there was something different about this Jesus he knew Jesus was a gifted teacher. I mean, people were following him everywhere. He'd probably heard that Jesus was a prophet. Maybe, maybe Zacchaeus was afraid that being that close to someone as holy as that would be a problem. I mean, he probably felt unworthy, self-conscious, maybe even a little guilty. Because, you know, prophets call people back to God. That's what they do. Zacchaeus knew how far he was from God. Maybe Zacchaeus felt like he needed to get his life straight before he could come face to face with Jesus. You know, we hear that so often today. People say that they know that something in their life needs to change. Maybe they even think that, that they might need God. But they got to get their life straightened out first. But they're never going to be able to do that. That's, that's never going to happen. They'll never be able to get their life straightened out by themselves. It's not possible. See, we are by nature sinners. We may be able to improve our, our outward actions for a while. But deep down inside, we know that there is something wrong. We'll never be good enough to stand before God on our own. 
our current sin, our, our history of sin, our future sin will always prevent us from approaching God. You know, people who want to get their lives together before they think about God are like Zacchaeus up in that tree. You know, they may be curious, but they're never going to find what they're looking for. In verse 5, though, an amazing thing happens. <coughs> Zacchaeus was up in that tree watching, and as Jesus got close to the tree, he looked up in the tree and he saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wasn't able to get close to Jesus. Instead, Jesus came to him. Through the maze of people, through the crowd that was surrounding him in the midst of all that noise and chaos, Jesus saw the man. He saw the one. The individual, the one who was too scared to come close, the one that was pushed away by the world, by the religious, and, and by himself. Jesus looked up and he saw Zacchaeus in that tree, a man rejected by the world, shunned by the religious, torn by the guilt in his own life, a man who knew that he was unworthy to stand before this holy man. <clears throat> and as Jesus looked up there in that tree, as he stood there looking at him, he said, Zacchaeus. He said, righteous one. You come down. Immediately. I have to stay at your house. The word of God is powerful. And it's effective. Jesus, Jesus called him righteous one. And, and, and that is what he became. Zacchaeus came down at once, but he came down from that tree. A different man than he was when he went up it. When he climbed up that tree, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was an outcast. He was rich by the standards of the world. A wealthy man in a wealthy town. He was a man looking out only for himself. He was a man who was ruled by sin. But Jesus called him, and his world changed. Zacchaeus couldn't change himself. It took Jesus to change him. Jesus declared him righteous, and he was. See, Zacchaeus went up that tree as a man of the world, and he came down. He came down as a child of God. When Jesus called him, it was a personal call. Jesus called to him up in that tree. He called Zacchaeus. Jesus called him by name. And isn't that the way it always is? But think back to when you were saved. Was it something in general that brought you to Christ? Or was it specific? Was it just something out there that brought your mind to understand spiritual things? Or was it something specific? Maybe it was during a sermon and the preacher said something that made you think he's talking to me. Maybe it was personal evangelism. Someone was talking to you about Jesus and all of a sudden it hit you that this was about you. What you needed. See, God calls individuals to salvation. Jesus didn't look up in that tree and say, whoever's up there, come on down. He calls Zacchaeus by name. And he calls us by name as well. Look what happened when Jesus called him. Verse 6 says, Zacchaeus came down immediately from that tree. 
New American Sanders says that he hurried and came down. But, but the way I imagine it is that Zacchaeus scurried out of that tree. This head tax collector. This older man scrambled down to get out of that tree where before he tried to keep his distance from Jesus. Now he couldn't keep himself away. It no longer mattered to Zacchaeus what people thought of him. The Lord wanted him. Zacchaeus couldn't wait. The radical change had taken place in Zacchaeus. He had come to Jesus now. But the Lord didn't want to just shake Zacchaeus' hand and move along. Our text says that the Lord told Zacchaeus he was going to stay at his house. Jesus was going to abide there with him. You know, when the Lord calls us, he abides with us as well. He stays with us. Today, he abides with us through the person of the Holy Spirit. According to Ephesians 4.30, when we're saved, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We are never left alone. The last words that Jesus said to his disciples in the book of Matthew give us that assurance. Jesus said, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But the world wasn't done. The world wasn't done. It wasn't given up yet. Look how the people react. Verse 7 tells us that the, all the people saw this and they began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. You know, this complaint of the people is directed in two ways. First of all, it's directed at Jesus. Didn't Jesus know that to be the guest of a sinner was tantamount to sharing in that sin? Look at everything that Zacchaeus has done. <coughs> He's a thief. He's a traitor. How could Jesus be the Messiah and associate with that kind of a person? You know, it wasn't the first time Jesus heard this. Luke 5, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complained that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. In Luke 7, they complained about the loose woman who anoints Jesus' feet at Simon the Pharisee's house. In short, their understanding of their place before God was faulty. They saw themselves as being righteous. As ones who were worthy of the attention of God. But the complaint was, it was also directed at Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, you're not good enough for Jesus to have anything to do with you. You ever notice what usually happens after you've had some kind of a major spiritual experience? You're up here on this mountain and the world crowds in and it tries to eat away at that experience. Right now, Zacchaeus is at a spiritual high point in his life. And Satan, through the world, can't stand that. The world is trying to play on Zacchaeus' fears. Just a little while ago, Jesus was up in the tree. Jesus, Zacchaeus, was up in that tree thinking the very same thing. But something's different now. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is not the same person he was just a few minutes ago. Verse 8 shows us an amazing transformation. Zacchaeus stood up and announced that he was giving away half of everything he had to the poor. This is the same man who before tried to work every angle to get ahead. The same man who would extort money from his countrymen. The same man who put himself above the law and sought only his own personal gain. And he's given it away. But he goes beyond that. 
Zacchaeus also publicly repents of his sin against the people, and he makes restitution. He said, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay them back four times the amount. Now, in Greek, this is what's called a first-class conditional. Okay? It carries the meaning of, uh, of something like this. It says, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, and, and I have, I will pay them back four times the amount. Or even something along the lines of, to the extent that I have cheated anyone, I will pay them back. Or since I have cheated them, I will pay back four times. Four times. Now, there's nothing in the Jewish law that would require that kind of restitution. The law calls for a restitution in the amount of the amount stolen plus 20%. Zacchaeus is paying back 400%. His encounter with the Lord has radically changed his worldview. And it shows. His actions show it. Some might see this verse as Zacchaeus trying to do good to make up for all of the evil that he's done. As Zacchaeus trying to earn his salvation. But Zacchaeus has not given away the major portion of his fortune in order to win favor with God. Nor to win favor with man. He's not trying to earn his salvation. His salvation has already come. His salvation resulted from his encounter with Jesus. His actions flow from that salvation. He's producing fruit in keeping with repentance, as John the Baptist admonished the Jews. Instead of using people for his own gain, Zacchaeus is now looking for a way to serve them. His salvation is shown to be real by the radical change in his life. And Jesus confirmed that change. In verse 10, he says, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a child, a son of Abraham. Now, Zacchaeus was a Jew, right? He was from the lineage of Abraham. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. It said Jesus is saying that Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham because of his repentance and faith. Salvation has come to Zacchaeus because he's believed God and he's returned to him. A few years later, in the book of Galatians, Paul would tell us that it's faith that makes someone a child of Abraham. He wrote, consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And and further he wrote, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Everyone... Everyone who trusts in Christ is a spiritual child of Abraham. It's not the physical descent that matters, it's faith. And that faith results in salvation. It doesn't matter whether you're a Gentile or a Jew. It's faith in Christ, the Redeemer, the Son of God, that provides salvation and eternal life. Jesus tells us Zacchaeus has been saved. And then Jesus goes on to sum up his entire ministry in one verse. It's a verse that many of us know. Verse 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus was sent, and he willingly came to search for and to rescue those who were lost and perishing. Friends, that was us. We were trapped by sin. Lost in our sin nature. Unable to find our own way 
back to God. But God's Son, Jesus, the Christ, came looking for us to rescue us, to save us, to bring us back into a right relationship with God. The story of Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus points out several things. A few we observations. The first thing is that it shows us that Jesus seeks us out no matter where we are, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Zacchaeus was separated from Jesus physically. He couldn't get to a place where he could see him. He was separated from him emotionally. Zacchaeus was afraid. He was afraid of what the people would think. He was afraid of what a direct confrontation with Jesus would do. That's why he ended up in the tree. He was separated spiritually. Zacchaeus knew that he was a sinner and that he had no place before a holy God. And so Zacchaeus did not get to Jesus. Instead, Jesus sought him out. The second thing we see is that Jesus calls us individually. Jesus looked up into the tree and he called Zacchaeus by name. Jesus said that the shepherd knows his sheep by name. And he calls to them. He leads them out and they follow him. When Jesus called his disciples, he called them individually. There was no mass call. He knew them. He sought after them and he called them individually. Third thing that we learn is that Jesus' call to salvation radically changes our lives. Zacchaeus went from a money-hungry, unethical thief to a man willing to give away most of what he had to help others. That, my friends, is a radical, radical change. I know in my own life, my salvation resulted in changes that I could never have Imagine. Before I was saved, I was very much in and of the world. I was always kind of rebellious, right? (laughs) I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, so you can imagine what that means. The kind of things that I was into. But one day, one day Jesus sought me out. And he called my name. And I responded and my life became radically different. My sister went to church with one of my former basketball coaches. He was also one of the deacons in the church that Susan and I uh, grew up in. Several years ago when she told him that I was going to seminary, he said, miracles do happen. How about you? Is your life different because you know Christ? When non-Christians see you, do they see someone who's radically different than themselves? And one more thing that we learn in this is that the radical change in our lives leads to radical actions. What happened with Zacchaeus? When Jesus came into his life, it wasn't only about an internal change. Action resulted. The changes that occurred weren't just internal. As important as those changes are, they were also external. The change in Zacchaeus' life resulted in changes to other people's lives. His faith resulted in action because, as James put it, faith without works is dead. Our faith should lead to action. Our faith should cause us to see the world as Jesus sees it. You know, Jesus looked on the people and he had compassion on them. Jesus prayed for them. but That wasn't enough for him. He went to them. He touched their lives. He healed them. Remember Bartimaeus? He fed them. He cared for them. And they came in droves. 
Excuse me, he came, they came in droves to see him. So why aren't people coming in droves today? Could it be that we're not showing them the real Jesus? Could it be that the Jesus that we're showing them is one who's more concerned about us than he is them? Don't get me wrong. It's not that our growth isn't important. It is. But it's not enough. As the old saying goes, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. We need to be reaching out to the world around us. We need to be caring for the world. We need to be going and making a difference everywhere that we go. So how do we do that? How can we make a difference in our world today? How can this small church really hope to impact this neighborhood or this city or this country or the world? Well, it starts with us. It starts with me. And it starts with you. Are we willing? Are we willing to let Jesus work in us and work through us in a radical way? Are we willing to scramble down a tree and look like an idiot in order to follow him? You know, it, it might be scary. It might be uncomfortable. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus and if we follow him, it will always be worthwhile. Are you ready? Are you ready to follow Jesus like Zacchaeus? Show the world that your salvation is real by showing them the radical change that Jesus makes in your life.